Thanks, Dylan, and um, a real pleasure to be here. Um, Dylan has been with me on <clears throat> much of that journey, and uh, when we have time, we can go into uh, uh, how he's been both supportive and helped advance the cause. Um, it's really an extraordinary pleasure to um, share a platform after Honley. My only regret um, is that as I sat there, I was wondering what would have happened if Michael Russell and Honlick had had a chance to sit down and talk together 40 years ago. He had the ideas, he had the notions of the science, but he didn't have the sense of building the technology, the market, and the sales capability, um, as so often happens um, with innovators. If they'd been sitting together, I suspect we would be in a better position in terms of tobacco control worldwide. So um, I've been given a chance to reflect both on what Michael Russell's contribution has been, but to give you a quick sense of where I think we, we're headed and what we might need to do. Um, I do that on with a device that doesn't want to work. Uh, let me try this one on. That's better. Okay. So um, I'm going to um, very briefly give you a couple of the, the sense of what Michael Russell's ideas were, and I've been able to verify these uh, recently over dinner with his extraordinary wife, Audrey, who lives in uh, my original city of Cape Town, and asked the question, why have we ignored some of the ideas for 50 years? What has led to their re-emergence? Um, and talk a little bit about risk, risk perception uh, before starting to move towards harm reduction. Um, I think it, we all know well that really it was Mike Russell who, on the public sector side, um, identified very clearly the need to separate nicotine as an addictive agent from the factors that cause death and disease. We also know that this was known before he started doing his work, and in documents that came out of uh, disclosures, we know that um, within the Brown and Williamson documents, uh, way back in the early 60s, there was already an understanding that nicotine was addictive. We had the business of selling nic nicotine, an addictive drug effective in the release of stress mechanisms. Very important to really look at those, not with suspicion, but to look at another intent that was lurking there all those years ago. Maybe there's a way to address stress. Well, that's kind of a good thing if it played out. Of course, stress reduction came along um, with lung cancer, tragically. The Surgeon General's report of 1964, people often forget, contains very clear language about um, nicotine and not representing a significant health problem. Evidence that's continued to just simply grow over the years, despite what many colleagues in public health and physicians believe. The evidence was there 50 years ago, it's probably got stronger. And then of course, Mike Russell's famous statement um, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, in the British Medical Journal. If people cannot stop smoking and smoke mainly to obtain nicotine, there's no reason why cigarettes should not be made which allow them to have their nicotine without having it contaminated by excessive amounts of tar and carbon monoxide. Onlyx done that. Many of you are sitting on products that are starting to do that. I guess that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, though, I'm going to continue. Uh, I, I, I was always struck by uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World where many of you may remember that he wrote about an ideal pleasure drug without harmful effects called Soma. And in it he writes, by this time the Soma had begun to work. Eyes shone, cheeks were flushed, the inner light of universal benevolence broke out on every face in happy, friendly smiles. Even Bernard felt himself a little melted. This is where uh, people were thinking way back that maybe we would actually have something that would give us a psychoactive lift, something that would be inert for all other uh, consequences and would not give us uh, lung cancer or cardiovascular disease or chronic diseases or low birth weight, whatever it is, but would give us that psychoactive lift. What do we use in daily life today? We use caffeine, we use a little bit of alcohol, we use other substances, and some choose to use nicotine, and maybe there'll be other substances. I suspect that this world is going to unfold even faster than we suspect as the boundaries of neuroscience expand and the demands for reducing stress 
and enhancing brain power increase over time, not reduce. Well, again, go back to the original documents from uh, British American Tobacco, who you had some folk lurking inside the bowels of the industry, not knowing that years later would read this stuff. It's my conviction that nicotine both helps the body to resist external stress and also can, as a result, show a pronounced tranquilizing effect. And it goes on. Smoking has considerable psychological advantages. It is almost impossible to take an overdose of nicotine in a way it is only too easy to do so with sleeping pills or with painkillers and a range of other pharmaceutical products. Again, I put that here to start semi-provocatively reminding us of what the intent was. This was before or just as they were starting to look at some of the harmful health effects. Imagine if we had adopted some of those ideas more swiftly. And those who may not know, it was Michael Russell who helped develop nicotine chewing gum. And I put up just one of the many obituaries that uh, followed his death in 2009. Um, in talking to his wife, she shared with me many of the amazing obituaries that happened at the time. And I was struck in the discussion with him uh, about him uh, by another interesting similarity to Honley. Not only did they both set out to separate the effect of tobacco, uh, for, uh, the nicotine from tar, but they did it in a very gentle way, a way in which their own personalities undervalued, in fact, the incredible power of what they were doing if they succeeded. And I think that's also something that often is seen as a sign of weakness, yet it's a sign of incredible strength going forward. So why have we ignored all this for 40 years? Part of the reason, uh, I think, is the fact that we did take correctly a public health approach. We applied what was then seen as the dogma of the time, tax, which works, and so is needed even more. Banning uh, advertising and marketing of products that kill you, which is needed even more. Banning sales to kids, which is still not implemented in the vast majority of countries, particularly developing countries. Um, bans on smoking in public places, which have an impact, a positive impact. All of those measures were good and right and are strong and are still not fully effective around the world and are needed. They're needed because six million deaths is just simply too many to tolerate and we've got to be taking strong paternalistic actions. That, though, meant that we displaced the focus on individual consumer preferences. We stopped listening to the smoker. We stop thinking deeply about what is it in the individual behavior of people that would help us complement these public paternalistic measures with those driven from the consumer and from the market that could actually alter the way we think of the future. And for that reason, I often sat in meetings at WHO finding that the issue of smoking cessation was put to one side. It was seen not as part of main tobacco control policy. It took an enormous effort, and finally the efforts actually of a student-led group led by a guy called Sonny Kishel to get nicotine replacement therapy finally onto the essential drug list of WHO because none of the public health officials thought it was necessary or important of the rank of a cancer treatment um, as, uh, that was needed. That was the reality and still remains the reality for many public health people. And as I say, we've got to be very careful that we don't say any of this is bad. This is all good. We need more of this. We need it more effectively because this is what drives down the population levels. But as the population levels come down, they get to a point where we're dealing with people who are physically addicted, people who have a substantive reason to be smoking, and those who may simply have the choice to actually want to enjoy nicotine. When we get to that point, we face the, big, the second biggest threat, that the experience we've had of anything with the word tobacco in it uh, has been bad. We've learned to distrust uh, the science of the tobacco industry, We've learned to distrust the way they lobby. We've seen actively through documents that I had to pour through at WHO, how officials were bribed, that uh, policies were distorted, our government efforts were thwarted, research was changed, all by tobacco companies looking at their short-term profit motive. That's all true, and that remains, unfortunately, the lived experience of many in public health who come out of that era. I'm going to come back to that, of course. So what's led to Russell's ideas re-emerging now? <coughs> Honolik, your work has played an enormous role 
we think of technology disruption in other fields of endeavor, whether it's the oil industry, or whether it's the food sector, or whether it's an area of IT. Uh, anybody reading about the development of computers and uh, the internet realizes that there are breaks when an innovation is introduced that has effects we can't even predict. This is one of those break points. Going further than talking about separating the harm uh, from the pleasure part of a product in ways in which the consumer will enjoy it goes beyond the pharmaceutical approach to the patch and the gut. And of course these figures are completely out of date, but I just like this old slide. It was in one of the very early slides of um, Bonnie Hertzog at Wells Fargo, who on the investor side is starting to see the power of this. I also put this up to say that, to remind us that we are not talking about just e-cigarettes exploding from this point. We're talking about a range of reduced risk products. And for shorthand, you'll see them as RR. I don't know what we actually should call this category. But clearly, we need to see e-cigarettes as part of this broader spectrum of efforts to separate the nicotine part from the rest, which is causing the damage. The other big change we see are general changes in technology and consumer demand for healthy living. This is an accelerated process, and I liken it to what we see um, in the way in which the soda uh, the, or the soft drink industry is transforming. Two, three decades ago, all we had a choice was for a Coke and Pepsi of full calorie nature. What do we have today? We have an explosion of innovation in the low and no calorie range which actually in volume terms is now substantially more than what were the more harmful full calorie options. And these are being led by small startup companies developing a mushroom based uh, beverage which may go global or viral, whatever it is, um, to protein based products, to different types of waters and fruit juices and so on. The same is happening in this category. Uh, from the small starting point of a traditional cigarette, we've seen the explosion of innovation occurring, whether it's going to be the vapor-driven products, the different types of these cigarettes, the heated but burned products, even some of the snus products, all sharing that same characteristics. Consumers are demanding that they are starting to confer reduced risk. It's coming at a time when we have better opportunities to innovate. The technology in many of these uh, doodads that people have got in the room look incredibly simple, but they actually are highly engineered, far more engineered than the traditional cigarette. They've taken advances, they've taken advances in developing battery science that I suspect will allow us to stick a hot dog in the end and actually have hot, hot dogs when we want them. Um, all the way through to a wide range of other innovations in how you deal with the vapor and so on. Um, and this is just the start. And I put up here the fact that the convergence of brain science, the desire of people through my watch to actually know how they're doing daily and some of the new products, these just happen to be the Marlboro ones out there, um, are forcing the pace of innovation at a rate we never thought of a few years ago. It was a dull, boring industry selling roll-up tobacco with a little bit of engineering. That's changed, and it's changed forever. Um, and as we saw in the soda area, we're not sure where it's going, but it's tending to lead to products with reduced harm. The response, many of you in the room know how you're responding, I just, um, in preparing for this talk, looked through many of the testimonials I get randomly. Whenever I give a talk, somebody says, you know, I, you're so right, and this is my story. I just took this one from a guy in California who wrote to me just before coming here. Um, and he said, I could put up his photograph and you can give his name if you wanted it. But to Christopher, um, at age 60, he'd struggled to try and uh, stop smoking until he actually turned to his cigarettes. And his words, for me, it's been a miracle. Um, this is an anecdote, but the anecdotes are starting to turn into tens of thousands of millions of people, and eventually that becomes a solid piece of epidemiological science to drive policy. What the consumers do is watched by the industry, by the investment community, and when Wells Fargo puts out a statement saying that over the next few years, vapor consumption could surpass uh, combustible cigarettes, her job's on the line if they don't make it, and while we may not meet exactly that target, we seem to be accelerating towards it. And we could get there with reduced risk if we put the right policies in place. And finally, on this, this category, we're starting to see think tanks um, like the uh, state budget uh, solutions people, who are then saying, well, the other benefits we haven't even thought of. 
huge savings to the Medicare bottom line if people start taking up these products. Large savings that we're going to have to pay out in terms of healthcare costs over the decades coming will actually be conferred if we actually reduce the risks. The science, as you know, is evolving, and I'm not going to go through it. But certainly my perspective is that, um, that from based on the last two meetings I've been in, the World Conference and the SRMT meeting, that generally the e-cigarette uh, um, use appears to be helping smokers quit tobacco. The evidence on that seems to be getting stronger. And the evidence that e-cigarettes served as a gateway um, away from tobacco seems to be getting stronger, not the other way around. But the media regulators, physician and health groups remain concerned. And um, what doesn't help it has been the trends in the media. So what I track here have been the, um, the Google trends in the US using some of the terms related to e-cigarettes and tobacco um, smoking. The interesting thing is that e-cigarettes now um, have gone beyond the reporting and the discussion on e-cigarettes in the media has exceeds that on tobacco control, which means it's a topic more discussed than tobacco. And when you look at the predominant type of stories, and this is just a random selection, they tend to be scary stories. So the stories are dominating the minds of a consumer, whether it's a smoker or non-smoker. And what are they hearing? They're hearing about deadly explosions. They're hearing about these being deadlier than regular cigarettes. These are from certain things out there. The hazards of these cigarettes, the high levels of formaldehyde, the serious cancer risk of vaping. What this does to a consumer who's in doubt will be if I'm a smoker, God, I'm not going to try that new thing. Let me stick with the safe cigarette that I had in my hand, which is, you know, a pretty bad decision, that one. So risk perception drives behavior and drives action. We've always heard this. This came out um, after the, um, uh, during the Ebola outbreak. The absolute terror of Ebola, yet um, not making any changes in risks that really make a difference to your life. Or you have a probability almost of zero of getting um, uh, Ebola, in, particularly in the US. And by the way, these entire slides are of course going to be available to all of you. Um, I always go back to Paul Slovic's work. Paul Slovic was a very famous cognitive psychologist is uh, very much around, uh, living up in um, up the north northwest, um, and he started his work as working in the nuclear industry, um, and started looking what happened after Three Mile Island, when actually very little happened in terms of deaths. In fact, nothing happened in terms of deaths. But the fear of nuclear power ended the building of nuclear power stations in the U.S. for decades, and the consequences many people believe has been the acceleration of climate change damaging coal power stations with massive, massive negative impacts on the environment. That perception drove the regulators <coughs> away from support, drove the investor community away from support. And that's the big fear that we all face at this point. If the regulators go one way or the other in support of where the perception is going, we could kill off the very innovation that could solve some of the biggest problems we have in public health at a time when they have the biggest impact. There have been many studies on this, and I think we need to do more of it, looking at how one perceives risk and what is the actual hazard measured in numbers of death or the impact. And so I put up here many of the classic ones from a colleague who's written this up. Uh, the fear of a terrorist attack or a plane crash. Um, or many of these things really terrify us because they make the news, they seem immediate, um, and yet we know the actual numbers are tiny. Um, shark is another one I could put up, being from South Africa and being a long distance swimmer. I can assure you every time I go for a swim in the sea, and particularly a long one, I get told by my family and everybody else, you're going to be killed and eaten up by a shark. The risk of going to the water to go to have a swim is about 10,000 times higher of having a car crash and dying of it than stepping into a water where you know you've got a shark or two. That's where they live, for God's sake. <laughs> anyway, um, if you look on this table, you'll see that the real risks are things like cancer, motor vehicle injuries. And then if you take our category, the public outrage and fear is on the reduced <coughs> risk of tobacco products where the risk is close to zero compared to the tobacco one. So again, stressing the perception. And this is played up and supported by many of the publicly funded campaigns we now have. And I put up here um, on the top the latest California Health Department campaigns against e-cigarettes. 
On the bottom, I put up a campaign which was run by buddies of some of us in the audience, Dalit Bal, a few years ago, which was fantastic. And you may remember this. This is the Marlboro setting. It was Bob turning to his buddy and saying, I've got cancer. It was science-based because he smoked. He has got a high probability of dying of cancer. Compare that to the, the ones at the top, which are just running now. And now you're a smoker in California. You remember the ones on the bottom, which told you this was a bad thing to do. And you're still a smoker. You didn't listen to him. And now you're reading about lungs collapsing if you take e-cigarettes. Are you going to really start switching away from your tobacco product into one of those things that are going to cause your lungs to collapse? Or are you going to remember that the bigger message and the truthful one was the Bob I've Got Cancer message? If they ran them together, or ran the Bob I've Got Cancer one maybe 10,000 times bigger than the e-cigarette one, I'd probably feel happy because there is always a potential risk on these things. But they didn't do that, and they don't put the two risks up front in your face. So what do you expect our medical professions to do? Well, they give bad advice. Physicians should inform their patients of the risks of using e-cigarettes, even if regulatory authorities have not taken a position on efficacy and safety of these products from the World Medical Association. I've got two buddies who worked in the World Medical Association in the audience uh, closely somewhere here, and there's Dylan Newman who was the head of the World Medical Association when we actually strengthened uh, the Framework Convention with the use of doctors. Now he's got to go back to them and get back his position and sort them out because this is actually sending the wrong signal to the national medical associations of the world. They are being advised to tell smokers even that they should rather stick with that product than try an e-cigarette. Even if you have all these other worries about some safety issues and about kids, in a smoker facing a doctor, surely you have an ethical responsibility to say to them, you've tried everything else, try these cigarettes. We believe that may work for you. Or even worse, George Ray from the British Medical Association of the Northeast. He's from England, I don't know where the Northeast is. You, you know, Martin, somewhere, I don't know, it's in the sea somewhere. Maybe it's very cloudy or misty, or I don't know what, but there are potentially more cancer-forming chemicals within e-cigarettes than you've actually got in cigarettes per se themselves. Can, yes. I just, can I just pick up on that? Because he was criticized very heavily Good. for that by the BMA. Did he withdraw so, the statement? Yeah, he wasn't speaking on behalf of the No, I'm sure he wasn't. It doesn't matter if he's speaking on behalf of it. He did have the title in his name, and I think yeah. that's the problem. And they're, they're worse. Um, so here we have Tom Frieden. Um, yes. High level representation of reduced products. So what is very interesting, and nobody seems to pick up, was is the construction of the statement. If they get another generation, blah, 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 that's more harm than good. If they get smokers who have quit to keep smoking, still quitting, more harm than good. When you read through this, you see lots of statements all ending with more harm than good. Those of us who happen to have a certain religious persuasion will get the sense that what he's saying is Diana. Um, and it goes through Diana, 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 and that is good enough to actually drive the policy change. Where Diana means that is sufficient in Hebrew. And there's a song where uh, people sing it. And they say, well, they can go through all the terrible things. Any one point you can stop because that's enough to drive the policy. Um, Tom understands that. And I suspect he's playing on that very clever theme. The problem is every one of these statements is subject to debate and dispute. Every single one of them. And this is the head of the CDC putting it out. It's not some general official. And he speaks for the government at the time when the FDA, luckily, is saying slightly more responsible things. From my own country, South Africa, we have the Minister of Health uh, recently saying, if he, if, if it were up to me, I'd ban our electronic cigarettes. But I think his statement is more helpful in one sense, that he goes on to make the second statement. If there's one industry I don't sympathize with, it's the tobacco industry, because they've contributed nothing to humanity except damage. Well, the, he's saying why that distrust is there. And that, I think, is a reasonable thing for a number of people to do. But we need to help them separate the discussion on the quality of the science of being able to use a product and reduce your harm, and who you work with in getting there. I was talking to colleagues earlier about um, the fact that when you negotiate, say, with people who are making nuclear bombs, you don't have to trust them, leave it to trust uh, whether you're actually going to make progress. Because you're never going to trust those kind of enemies who are clearly up against you. 
What you need to do is to have independent verification of if they say they're going to do something that is going to reduce harm, they do it. You don't trust them. You put in place independent means of assessing whether they do it. So what does that mean in our sector? It means very simply, if we have companies, whether they're small, large, or multinationals, who say they are going to be going into this category, we should say to them, well, what is your long-term plan? Are you planning to actually reduce the harm of tobacco by putting in greater investments into reduced risk products? Yes. Okay, well, we'd like the numbers. Are you going to be doing it by increasing the marketing of those to people because the research without a greater marketing budget will get you nowhere? Yes. Let's see the numbers. Are you going to increase the sales force to do it? Because we would like to see how your sales force is actually responding to the focus goal that you have. If the answer is yes to all of those, you don't trust them, but you know that they're certainly on a track not to actually hide behind saying general things, but they get into the specifics. The more we can turn the pledges of intent into actual numbers that can be independently verified, the more I think we'll have an assurance that many of these companies are serious about the long term. And is that being done or possible? We've got colleagues here from the Robert R. Johnson Foundation who can explain how that same level of distrust existed with the food companies. And they, Robert R. Johnson Foundation, supported an independent oversight that when companies said they're going to take millions of calories out of the food supply, people laughed and said, we don't believe that. Well, an independent assessment was done by the toughest critics of the industry, which showed not only that they did it, they actually went way beyond it, and it stimulated greater industry interest. I think there are ways around moving away from the concern about trust that we need to do. And the last comment here is use of Solugi, um, saying that it's too early, and of course it's too early, we always need to new research. Um, in some ways, use is right, but we always need to act in the presence of imperfection. Of course, the fun thing about this lecture is that people often forget that Yusuf was a student in Michael Lusson's lab 40 years ago when he was developing these things. And we need to encourage him to relook at those old papers that he wrote with Michael Russell uh, 40 years ago. So I think that uh, when you put this together, this is the future that many fear. A successful, prospering industry um, uh, making its money um, at the time when initially it was killing people, now it's actually trying to reduce the harm. And as abhorrent as many people may find that, and it does sound a bit distasteful to many, uh, if that is the reality, surely we can look to the future and say we need to actually do what we're doing as public health people. Reduce the harm, reduce the risk, reduce the deaths. Even if it means working with those you most strongly oppose, who you may not agree with, and may distrust. So, coming to the end, um, the whole theme of harm reduction is accelerating. And I think that um, Bonnie Herzog uh, has summed it up quite beautifully, talking about leadership needed within the FDA, um, <coughs> quoting Mitch Zeller, saying that the societal debate around e-cigarettes needs to be refocused on issues that really matter, namely what role e-cigarettes or other potentially less harmful, non-combustible nicotine delivery systems could play in a net population harm reduction, reversing the trend of half a million Americans dying. That, I think, is a very powerful, very clear statement of the intent of the FDA head of tobacco control. He's doing a few things that we rarely see public officials. He's putting the numbers out front in your face, reminding us the goal is reducing half a million deaths. That's his job. He wants to find the way to do it. How he does it, and how we help him do it, is going to be complex. And it's not going to be done with some sweep of legislation. But it's basically going to require making sure that we regulate proportionate to harm. And that has enormous implications. So I also see that what we also require are clear, unambiguous messages on safety and the benefits of reduced risk to back products are needed. The Royal College of Physicians started doing this recently, where they said the main benefit of e-cigarettes is they provide inhalable nicotine in a formulation that mimics the behavioral components of smoking, but it's relatively little risks. Fantastic that they said it 50 years after BAT did and 40 years after Mike Russell. But they've now said it and we've now got products on which to sell. Um, moving ahead, my key point is this one of regulating proportion to risk. Whenever you see a regulatory discussion, you have to ask the question, is this going to tilt the balance towards reducing the harm of tobacco? or is it potentially going to inadvertently shift people back to tobacco or keep them in tobacco? 
So legislation that uh, requires prescriptions before you can buy these cigarettes sends them back into tobacco or keeps them in tobacco, clearly. Legislation that bans sales to children, e-cigarettes, but doesn't first put in place much tighter measures to actually show the kids can't buy cigarettes, tilts them more towards tobacco products. Uh, legislation uh, of many times that starts talking about taxation and increasing the price to be competitive with uh, cigarettes tilts them away from using those products and consuming the cigarette category. And I could go on. I think further we could be thinking about praising good, the reduced risk cigarette companies who commit to safety standards, avoiding youth marketing, making smoking obsolete, all of these things. And we between us could be drawing up, and already there are, draft frameworks of what that could look like. Having the companies get behind them is the first step to making progress. But don't think it's only the responsibility of the tobacco companies and the e-cigarette makers and the reduced risk companies. It's not. The entire corporate sector needs to come strongly on board. The retailers. In the US, we saw CVS withdraw tobacco products. They unfortunately didn't consider at the same time putting the category of e-cigarette users, despite the fact that they may increase their goal of improving cessation. That needs to happen. Those companies that are still looking at how they're going to become clean nicotine retailers need to be encouraged to move towards putting out front the value of e-cigarettes e and related products close to their pharmacy or in their pharmacy or take their pharmacy away, whatever they want to do, but do it in a way in which the traditional cigarettes are either out of the store or very difficult to get. The life insurers are still treating um, these products as equivalent to a cigarette for two reasons. One is they still have not yet been fully convinced of the benefits. It's something which we're all working on. And secondly, because we've got a gap in the testing. How do you test and validate adequately? Again, both of those can be addressed. Putting them together, there's a lot we could be doing to regulate proportionate to risk. And the goal, of course, would be this billion tobacco-related deaths that we have a television crew doing a whole movie about. Clearly, this could cut deeply into that billion deaths. Before ending, I think we must uh, agree with um, Mitch on the need for national debate on nicotine. Um, the failure of the Framework Convention uh, to have a very focused approach on nicotine regulation is something that we're going to have to address going forward. Because it's sending a signal to the public that everything related to tobacco can be treated as everything else related to tobacco, including the nicotine, yet that is not the case. So, let me end um, with a wonderful picture that um, Audrey Russell allowed me to share with you on their wedding day. Um, to remind us that change is possible. On his wedding day, I don't know whether it was Audrey who said, that is your last cigarette. Um, and he may very well have been frustrated, that's why he went on to use the patch and the gun. I don't know what the order, the order of causality was. Um, but I can certainly tell you that I think it's long overdue that we truly honor his work by bringing together his work and advice with the opportunity on Lick Office of Us to really make substantive progress. Thank you. Okay. So, Derek Yak, um, I think we all remember the piece that you uh, had in The Spectator a short while ago and that I believe brought all records for downloads from there and you've gained an awful lot of fans in the UK. What's been happening with you since then um, and, and kind of what prompted that speech that you gave this afternoon which was in my mind phenomenal and it will be played out in full before people see this. Well thanks enormously. Um, you know, I think I, I didn't expect the spectator response, and when they, they told me that it was exceeding their expectations and their records, I think what it was doing was playing to a large consumer base that I, I didn't really appreciate, were so active, were so concerned that their voice wasn't heard, and it's really starting to give voice to them in very practical, readable ways. I think so much of the science has become obscure. Mm -hmm. So um, when I started in the article by re-looking for myself at the SNUS debate, um, I was struck by how, as a public health person, when I was at WHO, we had tended to respond to the SNUS evidence saying, this is a trick, 
uh, it's a gimmick. It can't possibly as, be as good as that. And yet, over the years, the evidence has simply got stronger. Um, and if the benefits of SNOS are as big as they are, SNOS is nowhere near the full potential that we're seeing on some of the electronic cigarettes and perhaps what's going to be the next generation to come as well. Mm. It struck me that we have to talk about it and talk out about it. I then, you know, the, the chance to do the Michael Russell uh, lecture got me digging even deeper. And, um, and that's why I, I spent time with uh, Audrey Russell, um, uh, Michael's uh, widow, and um, was surprised at so many of the similarities in some of our career paths. Uh, he was born in Cape Town, loved swimming, got an Oxford blue for swimming. <laughs> I think it was a half blue. Um, I was a swimmer, born in Cape Town. We both went to the same university. Um, and when I was trying to track down whether his wife was still around, because I knew she'd be probably late 70s, early 80s, and not only was she around, but she was living down the road from my mum in Cape Town. <laughs> and um, in talking to her, I found somebody who was um, politically incredibly astute and smart, and who understood um, that part of the reason why Michael's work probably never had the full impact it could was probably his extraordinary humility and his gentleness as a soul. Uh, he focused on the science, he believed in the science, and he believed that so many of my scientific colleagues do, that the mere publication would lead to massive expansion. Mm. Not realizing that he was up against the traditions of the public health community, the traditions of an entrenched tobacco company, uh, the dislike of the, some of the ideas initially from pharma, and then they did take it up. And of course, they took his um, discoveries of the patch and the gum and expanded them, but never, never with the sort of deep understanding that he had that it wasn't going to be the patch or the gum that would solve the problem until they could mimic the desire and the experience of smoking that smokers sought. They didn't stick to have something on their arm or chewing gum. They, they sought something that gave them the full flavor, the full sensory perception. And that's, I think, where some of the failings happened. Yes. What, what do you reckon to... Uh the pharmaceutical companies' lack of involvement in E6. Why do you think they haven't taken it up? It's a thing that's intrigued me, you know, whether it's that um, they feel that it's um, a low margin market, um, even though, you know, certainly the, the size of the market could be potentially absolutely huge for them, um, whether they focus more on the big brands, high end product brands. You know, you could say, um, what's happening to some of the cheaper products generally in the pharmaceutical area? Things like penicillin, are we running into supply problems because the profit margins are so low? So I think these days, um, pharmaceutical companies being most generous to them um, would be saying, a blockbuster drug where we can attach a price tag of $100,000 plus is where we want to place our money. Putting it to something as boring and mundane where the margins are going to be very slim doesn't fit what is our model. The second is that they say, well, we've got some stuff out there, both um, Shantex and gums and things, which are doing all right. Um, we just need to increase their marketing. And um, they must be watching with great fear as they see many of their sales being cannibalized by the growing e-cigarette market. Mm. When I speak to colleagues who've shifted from, say, the bigger manufacturers of nicotine replacement into these startup um, e-cigarette companies, many of them coming with uh, backgrounds in, in sciences, um, they, they talk about the frustration that they have about trying to introduce the same products inside a pharmaceutical company and being met by the resistance saying, well, we can't possibly produce something that looks too much like a cigarette because we will be tainted and our entire product range will be tainted, as opposed to thinking about, well, if that solves the problem and reduces the deaths, isn't that what the pharmaceutical industry is about? So I think there are a number of factors why we haven't seen them deeply engaged. Do you think there's any possibility ever of a medicinal e-cig? I mean, is it possible to produce, using the technology that we have in our hands at the moment, a device that can conform to medicinal rules and regulations worldwide in terms of things like uh, consistent measured dosing and that kind of thing? Or do you think that that's probably not a good idea because everybody's different in how they want to use them? I'm pretty sure we're getting close to that. Um, some of the leading companies realize, I mean, the issues of safety and standards um, are not uh, brain science anymore. No. People know how to develop them. So some of the companies have been looking to the uh, Ventolin inhaler experience. How do you actually produce the dosing in the way in which uh, an inhaler does? There's not much difference in the science. 
many of them are, are introducing more electronic doodads to be able to have better measurable doses. Not only measurable doses, be able to monitor the time of day, the intensity, and all of these things. That sort of technology wasn't available when many of the asthma inhalers were first developed, no. and they are becoming more available. Can they standardize the quality and the standards and have tracking and tracing to show us that they're coming from factories that are approved? Absolutely. That's already, the, you know, many of the leading tobacco companies are already doing very sophisticated tracking and tracing right back to the source to know the batch number in which factory at what time they've been produced. Pharmaceutical companies are starting to have to do it anyway to address counterfeit medicines. So I think that the issues around safety, standards, um, normalization to meet whatever the regulatory framework is on the safety side are going to be relatively easy to overcome and that will displace a large number of products from the market. Um, many of the fly-by-night operators who are just taking advantage of the enormous consumer demand out there. Yes, I, th I, th I think a, a product that's demonstrably safe enough is where it needs to be and yes you're right, I mean there are some shonky e-cigs out there. Um, thankfully not very many, at least not in the UK. However, I do think when we get to May of 2016 in Europe, we're going to see virtually no e-cigs. Are, are you very familiar with the Tobacco Products Directive? Not very, no. I'll not push you on it then, because <laughs> that could be a disaster. But it's, it's an area where, if I might make a request, if you find yourself with a few spare days and nothing else to do and it's too rough to go swimming, have a look through it and then share your thoughts with us, would you? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. That would be marvellous because I suspect that that piece in The Spectator would outstrip even the last one. <laughs> well, I think what we're seeing, not, I mean, I know the, the US um, regulatory environment, I see it in some other countries. I think what's happening is that we know we've got a window of opportunity now for innovation to continue at pace, which could be shut down pretty quickly by. Um, depending on which way the regulatory environment goes. Yes. And that's why the key message of my talk is the message that you all, the whole community, is saying you've got to regulate proportion to harm. Yes. And you've got to regulate for the long-term transition to the easy, not hard. Yes. Um, and that requires, on the one hand, understanding the science of what's going on, and secondly, to change the attitudes to the tobacco companies and recognize that they can still be your worst enemy. It's irrelevant whether you like or don't like them. You've got to focus on the ultimate goal. If you can find a mechanism to have them go down a path of producing better and better reduced risk products, surely that's going to be able to use the very power that they have now for good instead of for bad. And that's what a regulatory environment should do. That's the wording that I, I interpret coming out of Mitch Zeller when he talks about the dilemma he faces at the US FDA. And it's also what I hear when I hear the um, public health minister in the UK talking. Um, so I think it's that people are not, it's, it's not that we're alone in that on the regulatory side. There are some voices, but unfortunately what tends to take over very quickly is the bureaucratic voice of a large institution. Yes. And then we get this crowd speak phenomenon. Everybody supports everybody else and they're not listening and remembering what the ultimate goal is. The ultimate goal is not to impose penalties on a bad industry, it's to promote public health. Yes. I often do think that they lose sight of the true enemy. And to me, the true enemy's always been COPD, lung cancer, exactly. pancreatic cancer, and stuff like that. And here we have something that can go an awful long way to reducing the incidences of those. To, well, I've been told, and I don't know whether you would agree, <coughs> that if every adult worldwide were to take up e-cigs and nobody smoked, we would still have a massive public health benefit. Would, would you agree with oh, that? Absolutely. Idea? I mean, it'd be one of the biggest triumphs in public health that we could have. We're talking about six million deaths a year, um, you know, worldwide, over a billion smokers. So if the billion smokers are able to be reduced by half on E6, you're going to drop the future deaths pretty dramatically. Yes. Uh, and a final question, given that you are effectively the father of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the World Health Organization seems to take a very dim view of e Do you foresee that changing in the foreseeable future? Well, one thing I always learned being at WHO was that there is no WHO view. WHO, they will tell you that um, WHO represents the will of member states, which is partly true. But when we were there, we had a period of being allowed to be activist public health officials, uh, led by an inspiring director general, uh, Brohan and Brantford, who drove us to keep saying, 
you've got to act in the best interests of public health wherever that takes you and sometimes it may take you into conflict with dogma and current approaches and so on. I think now we've got a very uh, meek and mild leadership who are scared of doing too much because they feel they're going to either be punished by their superiors in WHO or they're going to actually suffer the wrath of a few countries that tend to be vocal. And so they're not actually able to put out the views of the kind of discussions we've had in this session. Probably they wouldn't even be able to take part in a session like this, even though there's a ton of science that they should be listening to. Um, so the answer to that uh, lies in actually having the member states um, of the more responsible countries speak up. And the more they do, countries start listening. And we already saw, you know, at least the UK, Norway, um, other countries have got data which contradict um, every fear that we have out there about gateway being a big issue. Well, it's been shown it's not. Uh, quitting actually not happening among ESIG users. Well, it actually is. Uh, safety that these things are blowing up and exploding all over the place. Actually, that's not happening. Um, and each one of the myths can actually be dismissed by better evidence. And I think sticking to dismissing myths with evidence and making sure a couple of governments do that will, in the long run, have an impact. In the meantime, I don't think we just need to sit back. I think that the consumers are continuing to demand access to healthier products, which is very different from the past. It was very different having a consumer base of tobacco users demanding that we have no regulatory framework, uh, stop taxes who were working in accord with the tobacco industry. Now we're having them pushing them out in favor of health. Well, that's a force which is usually unstoppable when consumers start going down that direction. And how we actually manage that and work with those groups is going to be a challenge for the future. But it's one worth taking on. Exactly. Derek Yak, thank you so much for your time and thank you for the oration today. It was fabulous. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You.